Hey guys, so today we're going to learn a brief history of photography, and in this video we're going to talk on the evolution of chemistry and art. The word photography comes from the Greek roots phos or photo meaning light and graphe meaning writing or drawing. So I want you to try and picture a world before photography. Try and picture what the world would have been like. If you wanted to make an image before photography was invented, you would have had to do it through drawing, painting, or printmaking pretty well. And I've included um, a chronology for the history of printing because I think it's something that's contributed greatly to the advancement of civilization. And it's something that's been around for a really long time. So on the far left, we have um, a frontispiece of the Diamond Sutra from the Tang Dynasty, China. And, and a frontispiece is just, um, it's like a title illustration. So the first picture that you see when you open the book is called a frontispiece. And that's from the world's earliest dated printed book at 868 AD. The woodcut that's kind of towards the middle is from the German artist Albert Dürer, and he's very well known for his woodcuts. Um, and this was a pretty common practice for around that time period until we invented the printing press in 1440, which was pretty revolutionary because then people started mass producing books. And then on the right, we have The Soldier and His Wife, which is an etching by Daniel Hopfer, which etching is when you take a metal plate and then you coat it in something like wax or resin, you carve your image into it, and then you dip it in acid to eat away the metal plate. And then the image where it's been eaten away by acid will hold ink, and then you print that with the ink. So before photography, it would have been pretty difficult to make an image if you weren't already an artist or if you didn't have access to these resources. So photography um, started coming in sometime around the turn of the millennia. About the year 1000, we started seeing some experimentations with cameras. The first camera was called the camera obscura, and that comes from the Latin roots camera meaning room and obscura meaning dark. And I honestly feel like this probably happened by accident because there's a phenomena called the camera obscura effect that you can see illustrated in the diagram uh, in the bottom left. And what happens is sometimes when light passes through a pinhole into a dark room, you'll have an image that's being projected inverted on the other side. And this is called the camera obscura effect. So this is a natural phenomenon that they probably accidentally discovered. There's an example of this phenomenon happening in the top left in uh, Prague. And this was just an image that was created out of a pinhole in a tile in the ceiling. The man to the right of that pinhole image is named Thomas Wedgwood. And he is kind of credited to be the conceptual inventor of photography um, using the camera obscura. Like he saw the potential for that. And he had not successfully created a photographic image, but he did write about it. Uh, and those early writings on chemistry definitely influenced all of the people who made those discoveries later on. So in terms of a timeline, the camera obscura was invented around the turn of the millennia, so around the year 1021. Um, and pretty shortly after that, things started to pick up. So there was the first portable camera. And when I say portable, I mean it was probably about the size of like a lunchbox. It's probably a hefty cube. Following the invention of the camera obscura, uh, the world's first photograph was taken in about 1826, and then shortly after that, Kodak was commercially making and selling cameras. And from there, it picked up pretty rapidly to um, advance to the place where we now have cameras in our cell phones today. The reason that I started with the camera obscura is because I wanted you guys to, to really think about how long cameras have been around. Um, there's quotes on the internet, and one of which I found really kind of closely aligns to the premise of the film Tim's Vermeer, and it's that, quote, portable camera obscuras were used widely by artists as aids for sketching. So when you see those masters' paintings, if you suspect that they look too good to be true, they probably are. They probably did have photographic help. But I think that the important takeaway from this is that it is not cheating to use photographic tools, references, and tracings. And Tim who was just a really dedicated scientific mind um, and an admirer of art, decided that he was going to recreate that painting that you can see on the right, which is um, a Vermeer. So he actually built the room and then used the camera obscura, which you can see uh, him using in the image on the left, which is essentially just a mirror on an angle that reflects up to a lens. And then he can see the image in the lens. And he's using the lens to, to kind of trace the picture that you see he's put upside down so that he can uh, paint it right side up. 
So, so I think that Tim is, Tim's Vermeer is like a pretty huge inspiration for me. And it has been a huge inspiration for me as an artist because it made me realize that I can and should use these tools because people have been using these tools since they were invented. So the inventors of photography uh, were really a bunch of chemists that were kind of exploring uh, some pretty dangerous substances in the 1800s. Each of these chemists kind of had their own processes, even though most of them were kind of working with similar materials, which was namely a plate, some kind of binding agent, and silver salts. Among the earliest inventors is Joseph Nippis, and he's uh, credited for heliography. The image that he's, he's known for is called View from the Window at Le Gras, and this was captured using a camera obscura, where he, he figured out that if you, put a, if you took a metal plate and you coated it with bitumen of Judea, which is a naturally occurring asphalt, then the light would harden it in certain places, and then you could wash away the remainder and get an image. So he successfully captured the very first photographic image. Most of the uh, people that are credited with the invention of photography are English and French, and these are just a handful of them, and they each made a significant contribution to the chemical process of photography. William Henry Fox Talbot is known for salted paper and calotype processes, in which he would take calotype negatives and make salted paper positives from those negatives. The other thing that he's known for is discovering developer or gallic acid, and that would accelerate the exposure process on paper from one hour to one minute. So that was a pretty huge um, kind of point historically to be able to cut down on the time of that process like that. Hippolyte Bayard is a French photographer and is credited for creating the process of direct positives on paper. There's sources on the internet that say he claims that he invented photography before anyone else, but I really don't think it was a one-man show. I feel like all of these um, great minds were kind of working in conjunction with one another and feeding off of like the early writings of people like Thomas Wedgwood to create you know, their own advances and their own processes. Hippolyte Bayard was credited with presenting the world's first public exhibition of photographs in June of 1839. So that would have been a pretty mind-altering experience and thankfully wasn't considered witchcraft. John Herschel was an English polymath, mathematician, astronomer, chemist, and inventor, among other things. And he's credited for inventing the cyanotype, also known as the blueprint. And on the right, instead of an image of his, I have um, a cyanotype titled algae. And it's a photo or a shadowgram, which is made by placing either the algae or whatever it is directly onto the photosensitive material. And then you flash a light on it and pretty much take the impression like a shadow. And this was made by Anna Atkins as part of her book, Photographs of British Algae, Cyanotype Impressions from 1843. And Atkins is often considered to be the first person to publish a book illustrated with photographic images and, quote, some sources claim that she was the first woman to create a photograph, unquote. So that was pretty significant. And I know that her dad was friends with William Henry Fox Talbot. So that's, if you're wondering, as a woman in that time period, how she kind of got there, it was through family connections that she had access to these, these ideas and these um, processes. So Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre was a French photographer, and he's credited with the invention of the daguerreotype, which was actually the first commercially successful photographic process. And that meant that it made it accessible to the general public, and then you saw photography becoming a more commonplace practice. So Daguerre was actually collaborating with Nipis, and after Nipis's death in 1833, he continued to experiment with the properties of silver salts. And he was building on the work of those like probably Thomas Wedgwood and the German polymath Johann Henrik Schultz, among others. And what Daguerre did that was different from a lot of the other people was that he silver plated his copper plate. So he exposed a silver plated copper sheet to the vapor given off by silver iodine crystals, producing a coating of light sensitive silver iodine on the surface. Daguerre was also credited with using developer and the developer that he used was actually mercury vapors, which is probably not very good for your health. But at the time, it was something that accelerated the process enough that once you had brought the image forth, instead of having to wait for hours, then you could just stop it and fix it with um, likely a salt solution. I feel like he, he was probably more successful because he used double silver. And I'm not a chemist, so I can't verify that, but I feel like his photographs probably took better because he took the time to coat his plate in silver before exposing it with silver salts. So most of these people were kind of doing the same experiments, uh, like or similar experiments around the same time period. And that's why we made all of this progress was because they were all kind of working off of each other. The next thing I want to tell you about is tintypes or the collodion wet plate process, because that's something that I've actually had experience with through Christine Fitzgerald, who is a Canadian tintype photographer. 
this process is was wildly successful when it came about because it you were able to develop your pictures in about 15 minutes which for the time period was like very short so a lot of these inventors were experimenting with chemicals kind of similarly to each other, mostly using metal plates and putting silver salts on top with some kind of binding agent and fixing agent um, in order to keep the image on it. So Frederick Scott Archer is accredited with inventing the collodion wet plate process, and this preceded the gelatin emulsion process, which is also known as dry plate. Something else that Archer did that was really amazing is that he invented this process and he chose not to patent and published it in The Chemist in 1851. And so he actually shared his knowledge of the chemical process with everybody instead of patenting it. So that was a really awesome gift that he managed to give everybody who was experimenting with that at that time. So you begin by a sheet of metal. Most of the traditional photographic processes kind of do start with a sheet of metal and you coat it with collodion, which is a binding agent, and it was used by medical, um, medical practitioners to seal wounds. So the reason that you need the binding agent is because the image needs to be able to stick to something. So the collodion allowed the image to be bound to the plate. The next thing that you have to do is, in a dark room, you have to dip it in silver nitrate because that's photosensitive. That means that it will uh, change when it's exposed to light. And you had to do this in a dark room uh, and also not get the silver nitrate in your eyes because it would blind you if you did. So once you dipped it in silver nitrate for a few minutes, then you would take it out and put it into a black box container and put that container into the camera. And you had to do this because if you, if you brought it out into the light, it would totally ruin the plate. The reason that images initially were grayscale is because the silver salts were photosensitive. So grayscale is actually silver. So after you expose it in the camera, you know, you take your picture, you open your lens, let the light in, then close it up again. Then you bring it into the dark room and you have to pour a developer on it to accelerate that um, process and bring the image forward. And then you have to stop. You have to put it in water to, to make it stop and then uh, put fix on it, which at the time was, I think, a solution of salt and something else. Once that was all done, then your image was pretty much set on your plate, and then you could lacquer it uh, once it was like kind of dried and cured. So modern cameras um, function pretty similarly to old cameras in the sense that they have the lens, the mirror, and they actually have something called a pentaprism, which, which kind of bounces the light around and gets it to your viewfinder so that you actually see it right side up. In modern cameras, when you go to take the picture, uh, the mirror actually lifts up and then the light will hit the sensor at the back of the camera and that's how you get your image. The pros to modern cameras is that, you know, they have interchangeable lenses, we can really swap them out easily. There's digital sensors that eliminate the need for chemicals and they're like lightweight and smaller compared to uh, older cameras. The cons kind of are the need for digital storage and processing, which means that, you know, if you don't have the technology or the access to software and hardware to properly store and manage and edit your photos, then it makes it a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging in that regard. Now we're going to take a second and we're going to talk about a brief introduction to light theory. And this is like the art of photography. And the things that we're going to talk about in this section are composition, light and exposure. I kind of group those together because they, they go hand in hand. And then the decisive moment, which is timing. And all of those things are kind of captured in the image on the right um, from Pexels. So there's only three things that you need to know about cameras. Every time you pick up a camera, you're pretty much going to reference the exposure triangle. The exposure triangle is made up of aperture or f-stop, and that's basically how much light is being let into the lens. The second thing is going to be shutter speed, so how fast the camera will take the picture. And then the last thing is called ISO, which is essentially film grain or noise, and that kind of helps you in uh, low light settings. The first thing we're going to talk about is aperture. So think of a lens wide open as zero. So f1.4 is pretty wide open. It's, it's pretty much as close to open as most cameras will get you. Then the higher that you go, the higher the aperture, the smaller the light is, the tighter the hole is. And so different lenses have different aperture ranges, and the wider a lens can open, for example, f1.4, the better for capturing in low lighting. But you also have to know that aperture affects depth of field, and depth of field is what's in focus. So higher apertures, like f22, have a deep or large depth of field, which means that everything will be sharp and in focus, even if it's far away. Shallow depth of field happens when the lens is closer to being wide open, so like if you have it at 1.4. The image on top uh, is a landscape. 
by Kaylin Emsley, and it was shot at F-22. So that has a very large depth of field, with both the foreground and the background being in focus. The second picture is made up of two, two contrasting images. So the image on the left was taken with an aperture of f22, and then the image on the right was taken with an f2.8. So you can really see the difference in how blurred the background is. The image on the left has a deep depth of field because you can really see like everything's in focus pretty well, and then the image on the right has a very shallow depth of field. So that means that you can really only see a small range of what's in focus, and that's the, the flowers in the foreground. The next thing we're going to talk about is shutter speed. And shutter speed uh, is important for motion and motion blur. So the images of the fans kind of show you uh, different, different shutter speeds and how that will affect your image. So fast shutter speed means that you'll have less motion blur. And the example is on the bottom right for 1 over 1,000. So that's 1,000th of a second. Slow shutter speed means that you'll have more motion blur. So the 1 8th of a second, which is in the top left, shows you that you your camera takes a longer time in taking the picture and you'll hear it when it goes click, click. Whereas something that's really fast will just be like, it'll be very, very um, short shutter speed. So you can actually hear the difference when you're taking photos with your camera. Um, and changing the shutter speed will kind of give you different effects depending on what you want for motion. The last thing we're going to talk about is the ISO, which is the grain or the noise. And I left a quote from a website here that had kind of an introduction to what ISO is because I felt like it was really insightful. So it says, ISO is simply a camera setting that will brighten or darken a photo. As you increase your ISO number, your photos will grow progressively brighter. For that reason, ISO can help you capture images in darker environments or be more flexible at your aperture and shutter speed settings. Because you just kind of, when you're taking photos, you pretty much just take a balance of all three, uh, your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. So ISO can help you capture images in darker environments or be more flexible about your aperture and shutter speed settings. However, raising your ISO has consequences. A photo taken at too high of an ISO will show a lot of grain, also known as noise, and it might not be usable. So, brightening a photo via ISO is always a trade-off. You should only raise your ISO when you are unable to brighten the photo via shutter speed or aperture instead. For example, if using a longer shutter speed would cause your subject to be blurry. So now we get to the fun part of photography. So that's composition and the decisive moment. And in this section, we're going to talk about timing and geometry. So timing means being in the right place at the right time, as demonstrated on the left by this famous photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson and then the pixel images on the right. And the reason that I chose these images was because they are fairly similar with the water and the reflection and the jumping, like that, that moment where you have to decide to take the picture. The image for Harry Cartier-Bresson is kind of like one of the earliest photographs where we're seeing people really think critically about when do you take the picture? Is it, is it before anything happens? Is it mid-action? And he's kind of here, he's taken it just the moment before the foot touches the water. The, the image on the right is the moment after the foot touches the water. And so you kind of have like this really dynamic splash going on. So I think in both images, even though one photographer took the image before his foot had touched the water and the other one took it after, I think that they're both very captivating images and they both kind of demonstrate that timing is a really, you know, important thing. In terms of composition, uh, the golden ratio and the rule of thirds is kind of the sacred geometry that like underlies all beautiful images. And what I think is really interesting about the golden ratio and the rule of thirds is that they're things that are ingrained within us. This geometry is within us, and we don't really have to think about it. Most people are attracted to masterpieces for the sheer reason that this geometry is ingrained in it, but we often don't see it when we're looking at it. So being aware of this type of geometry is like really useful because you'll be able to casually make beautiful compositions without having to think too hard about it. The image on the left is the golden ratio, and the way that that happens is you take the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is like 1, 1, 2, 3, and you get each successive number in the sequence by adding the previous numbers. But this ratio, like when you look at the proportions of num each number in the sequence, it creates this beautiful spiral shell that's found in a lot of things in nature. And if you start looking for the golden ratio, or if you do a little bit of research on the golden ratio, you'll start finding it in everything in our faces, in our geometry as humans. The image on the right kind of emulates the rule of thirds, um, and I think that the rule of thirds is another really natural thing that we kind of want to. They're saying that on the internet that um, 
symmetry is a little boring for us, so we like we prefer to have either approximate symmetry or asymmetry, and those rules of thirds are really nice lines of sight for our eyes to look at. So oftentimes on cameras, you'll have the option to have a grid up, and you can like use the grid to decide your, to help with your composition. Yeah, the good news about these things is that most of it is intuition. So remember, trust yourself. Your intuition is good, so don't overthink to start, you know, just take some pictures. The other thing is that you can always take more pictures with digital, so there's no pressure on making it perfect the first time. Next week, we'll be looking at cameras, and I'll be doing a tutorial on how to actually interact with uh, the camera itself and how to navigate the settings on that. Um, some of the pictures that we used in the slideshow are from Pexels, and some of them are from sources on the internet. So if you're looking to explore more content on the history of photography or on um, foundational kind of introductory stuff for how to actually do photography, there's some really great references in here that I would encourage you to look at. There's links in the description below. Yeah. Thanks for watching, and I hope you guys had a, a good time and learned a little bit about the history of photography and learned a little bit about light theory uh, and composition. So. Until next time, the Creative Ace Team.